If you enjoy podcasts like this, you should check out our other shows on Health Podcast Network. For example, Highway to Health Podcast, hosted by Jeremy Quinby, provides guidance, quality resources, and inspiration for anyone seeking wellness in mind, body, and spirit. There's an episode that you should check out called The Value of Our Emotions, where Jeremy helps listeners understand the role emotions serve and what we can learn about our present state by staying attuned to them. Check out Highway to Health Podcast on your favorite podcast platform or visit healthpodcastnetwork.com. So the other day, I spent 30 to 40 minutes talking to a patient who was originally from Korea about their body pain. It was a kind of pain that happened once in a while, but wasn't there today. From that complaint, we ended up talking about mental health, stress, and social support. I thought we were on the same page. I thought we had a good plan as we wrapped up our visit. As I was walking out, she turned and said something to the interpreter. I didn't feel right. I don't know exactly what was said, but I thought I missed something. This is Cheryl Lee, the chief executive director of Korean Women's Association, talking about something her mom told her after a visit that she had. And so she's like, isn't he going to examine me? I said, mom, he asked a lot of questions. She's no, he needs to examine me. So that's something very important. It tells them that just whatever they say is not sufficient for you, the doctor, to know. And they want you to hear their heart, stethoscope, and touch and hear, feel their breathing just to make sure that they are being examined appropriately. Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, a family physician and a community organizer. You're listening to Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you, not just a body system. Let's learn together. Welcome back to Healthcare for Humans. It's been a while since we've explored a specific community. And today we're returning to one of our core themes, understanding the history and context of a particular community can help you provide better care. This episode will be about the Korean community. Before we dive in, I want to set the stage with some context about South Korea. Let's try to cover some facts here. It has a population of about 51 million, and 7.3 million of its people have emigrated worldwide throughout history. Interestingly, about 85% of overseas Koreans are concentrated in just five countries. Can you guess it? United States, China, Japan, Canada, and drumroll, Uzbekistan. Interesting, right? A few other key events to know and remember. This will help inform the Korean immigration pattern to the United States, Canada, and other countries that we just mentioned. From 1897 to 1910, Korea existed as an empire. Obviously, before that, there were a few other empires too, but that's when we'll start. In 1910, it was annexed by Japan. In 1945, Japanese rule ended following World War II. In 1948, the Republic of Korea, or South Korea as we know it, was established. From 1950 to 53, the Korean War happened, which shaped the nation's trajectory. These dates are important as long as you have somewhat of an anchor to their history of how these wars have affected its people because this wasn't that long ago. Some other quick, quick facts that I want to tell you. It has the world's 13th largest economy by GDP. Its healthcare system is often ranked among the best globally, has a life expectancy of 83.5 years or so. And lastly, 27% of the population or so historically identified as Christian and 15% as Buddhist. This tells you about a country that's doing really, really well especially with the health of their population. I find it interesting to think about it from this vantage point of how they're doing here in the United States. This kind of context helps me to care for my Korean patients better and have a sense of possibility of good health that we could provide if we get all the pieces right. It's precisely this kind of context that our guest Cheryl Lee brings to light in our conversation today. She illustrates why this background matters so deeply in healthcare as you heard in the opening clip, about a Korean patient who felt an entire visit was not enough because there was no physical exam. In healthcare these days, physical exams are often less emphasized. 
but by not doing them in a way patient wants or expects, can significantly impact patient trust. This kind of thing is amplified in some communities, like the Korean community. Without understanding these nuances, we're going to risk missing a lot of information and erode the patient-clinician relationship. In this episode, we're going to do a few things. We're going to trace the journey of Korean Americans through various waves of immigration, from early sugar plantation workers to today's diverse communities, and what it means to care for them. Here are three key highlights you can expect. The crucial role of churches in Korean American communities, serving as more than just places of worship. The complex dynamics between Korean patients and healthcare providers, including the cultural reverence for doctors and its impact on patient care. Third, the relationship between Korean food and health, from the probiotic benefits of kimchi to the challenges of adapting traditional recipes for health reasons. Whoever you are, let's serve the Korean American community better. Here's Cheryl Lee. Okay. Hi, Cheryl. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Tell me a little bit about yourself. My name is Cheryl Lee, and I am the Chief Executive Director of a 50-year-old social services agency called Korean Women's Association, or we go by KWA. And initially, the organization was founded by several wives of the American military folks who married Korean women in Korea, and then they moved to Tacoma. And many of them had also some domestic violence issues in a new culture, new language, in new families. And so some got together to help protect their fellow Korean American women and friends. And hence the birth of KWA today. They started receiving grants from the state to be able to help many women in the domestic violence situations. And then they realized that they needed to also assist the families of these women who immigrated. And KWA Today is an organization that is providing social services, support to victims of domestic violence, crime. In addition to majority of it is focused on elderly services, everything from services for the elderly to get the state and federal government resources, as well as provide low-income housing for seniors, as well as provide in-home care for many city seniors who would like to live a dignified life in their home. So it's an amazing organization of about 1,700 employees, and it's just continuing to drive impact every day. I believe it. I've seen some of the work you all do and hearing it from you. Uh, I think it's obviously much needed in the community as well. As you stated, it was foreign for a specific reason, which is uh, women needing support after coming to the U.S. I think it's helpful for our listeners to know the context, but the waves of immigration. Tell me about the waves of immigration of Mm -hmm. Korean Americans to the United States and how that Mm -hmm. has looked different. Yeah. I think the first wave, at least there's a lot of documentation, are the uh, Koreans who came to work in the sugar plantations of Hawaii. (laughs) Many of them came in these ships and they were promised great life in America and lots of financial success. Little did they know, many of them came here and they barely made minimum wages. They were basically succumbed to live in these little tiny little shacks and they toiled away for 12, 14 hours a day. So that was the initial influx of Koreans to the United States. And then come later, I'd say the second wave is the international students. After the Korean War has come to a armistice treaty, many of the young people knew they had to be educated. And so many came to the universities in the U.S. and studied. And some definitely returned to Korea and to help build it to be what it is today. Uh, But many chose to stay here and raise their families. And so I'd say that's a a good influx. And so then you also have wives of American military folks. So after the Korean War, obviously, the U.S. presence in Korea has not stopped. And although the numbers have dwindled in the 60s and 70s, are significant numbers as many of the military folks married and found love. And so Korean wives came to America with their quote-unquote American husbands. And then they also invited their parents to come to basically be babysitters for their children because the wives had to work. And so then that was the wave of family immigration. So it's sisters 
And so I am also a beneficiary of that wave where my mother's sister married a American GI and she moved to the United States. And then many years later, she asked my mom, who's her older sister, if my mom would like to come here. And at that time, education in America was the gold standard. Everybody knew. And so really my parents sacrificed everything they had and they relocated a family of four children. And I was like seven and I had three other siblings. And so they moved to uh, Seattle. So that's from the mid seventies to about, I'd say mid eighties. That's wave three of the immigrants who are like families of these international students, as well as the military wives and, and their extended family. And then I'd say after that, you also have another wave of very different immigrants. These are more educated. They had some more financial freedom, wealth that they could bring. When my parents immigrated, the Korean government limited the amount of U.S. dollars that the family could take out of Korea. For a family of seven, so we didn't have the finances. Even if my parents had wealth in Korea, they couldn't bring it over. And so they had to work in manual jobs and clean at night and just hard, hard labor to raise their children. But the next flux in the 80s and the 90s are more of the educated, I say, as well as people who had money. The government had definitely relaxed those requirements and they were to move here to do businesses. They were able to move to the U.S. to basically offer education opportunities to their children. And so I'd say those are the kind of waves. And obviously today, seeing that number of immigration coming, and then a lot of people who are coming to the U.S. as investors in business. Thank you for detailing that so eloquently as it was done in all the articles we read about the immigration patterns. I think it's helpful for our audience member who are listening now to also have some context we've talked about in, in some of our prior episodes. That the first wave that you talked about of people going to sugarcane plantations happened right around the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act. The government needed, quote unquote, free cheap labor. So they encouraged this immigration. At the same time, as you noted, the pitcher brides, which were because the immigrants that came were bachelors and toiling away and needed to get married. They sent photos and they thought it was this great life. And then, as you said, they were tricked. Mm -hmm. So that first wave of Korean immigrants looked it's really different from the subsequent waves. Mm -hmm. And the second wave that you talked about, the, I think some more context around that, you talked about the groups of Korean wives after the Korean War ended around 1953 or so. But there was in 1945, the liberation from the Japanese annexation, mm -hmm. and then the Korean War in 1950. So there were so many people uh, wanting to leave Korea because there was so much conflict. The wives of American soldiers, war brides, as they said, who came, but also mm -hmm. orphans. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. were killed and they were mm -hmm. sometimes fatherless. I think the women were mm -hmm. discriminated against as quote unquote prostitutes because they slept with. Yes. Uh, that also came and that discrimination came in that wave too. Does mm -hmm. that sound right? Yeah. I've you know heard stories and serious discrimination in Korea because the orphans that were left behind, they physically looked very different. And so that in itself was a source of discrimination. And yes, there are some of the quote unquote mothers, they were called like the Asian dolls or whatnot because they dressed to appease to these Western soldiers there. So many of them obviously were adopted into family. And that's another one that I forgot. Also adoption. I don't call that an immigration wave because they had no choice. It, it's not an immigration wave. But yes, there's a significant number of adoptees, Korean American adoptees who also come to the U.S. in the late 70s, early 80s, and also post the war. But yes, many of the children that were left to live with their grandparents or many were left to be adopted. Again, the ones that were left with the grandparents, because physically they look so different, they were a source of definitely lots of jokes and discrimination in Korea. I was actually going to ask you the about the wave of adoptees that came through. So thanks for bringing that to the attention. I think what also gets lost is the history of Koreans to this country because there's a current day perception of what it means to be Korean American. So when you are talking about the waves of immigration, is there some element of that story that you think most people get surprised about or haven't heard about in terms of all the barriers and discrimination Koreans faced as they immigrated from those early days? Yeah, I think there's that concept of model minority. They think all Koreans are like successful and they've done well. 
I think people really understand that the first wave who came and toiled away their lives away in the fields of the sugar cane, working 12, 14, 16 hours a day, that never enters into anybody's thoughts. I think the Korean American adoptees, I don't think major, mainstream America really understands what that is. There's also this old American dream story where everybody came and America was a land of opportunity. But really, we have people from all kind of socioeconomic backgrounds, various education levels. And it's more of the highly educated international students in the 60s. But there's also then another flux who came in the 80s who basically had developed their financial wealth in Korea and chose to bring it to the U.S., Right. So those are things that I think most quote unquote mainstream America doesn't even realize. And so they just go off of this model minority. They came and they became successful and they don't even really know why. Yeah, people love the narrative. And one thing that stood out for me, especially about the Korean community, is the strong sense of community because of I think Korea as one nation specifically. Now I know South Korea, North Korea, but that identity as a nation with one ethnicity and one language, compared to some of the other countries which have tons of smaller ethnicity and indigenous groups. So I think that really benefited when Korean Americans immigrated here, holding on to the culture. And there's some literature on how that continuity of culture has been easier for the Korean community. Do you feel like that's true for you doing this work? When my parents immigrated, again, it was in the mid 1970s. And in Seattle back then, there was one Korean American church. And my father was not a churchgoer or a believer, but he got wind of that church. My dad, he had no concept of what a church is, but he knew that's where Koreans congregated. And I believe the congregation maybe was about 50, 60. And he took us four kids on a Sunday. And we recall uh, walking up to that church in downtown Seattle. And he wanted us to go there so that we mingled with other um, Korean Americans. The other thing that it's interesting what my father did was he wanted to make sure that our Korean language was preserved. And so in the 70s, he had my uncle ship primary school reading materials. And so my brother and I, because we were seven, eight years old, the youngest one was like just born and the other one was maybe two, three. But at least the two oldest one, he made us read those books. He made us keep up our written language in Korean and he made us write letters to grandma. When I say he made us, he did. And so that's really to this day, thank God I'm able to be a simultaneous interpreter, translator, straddle back between two languages. And so that kind of congregation in the churches was also really important. I do agree, Korea, relative to the landmass of some of the other Asian countries, is pretty small, right? Relatively small. And I think that's also what kind of brought people together. And so the churches were initially a place for the Koreans to gather, share food, which is such an important component of many Asian cultures. And that's no different from the Korean American culture as well. And so from that, many people who congregated, the churches have grown. And to this day, I believe there was one study done by one of the local newspaper, like a daily newspaper. And I believe the number was high 80 some percent were churchgoers, identified themselves as Christians in terms of their religious beliefs. And so upper 80 percent is huge when the global population of Christianity is what, maybe 30% if then? Mm -hmm. So yeah. when to this day, the church is a place for a lot of emotional, spiritual support and health, but it's also a gathering for the Korean Americans. And many of the churches actually also offered Korean language class so that the future generations and the second generations could also maintain their language and some of the heritage. And now we have more of the kind of professional schools that have evolved from it. But really in the 80s and the early 90s, a lot of that was done by the churches. Yeah, I'm thinking about what you just said and how maintaining that community is often a protective factor for people when they're coming to a new place and attempting to either assimilate or hold on to their identity. For You focused a lot on Christianity, but I didn't get a sense that Korea as a country was very Christian country. 
Is it because it was the way in your family story, this is the place Koreans went, so Christianity became our thing, rather than, hey, Jesus is our thing, (laughs) we're going to the church, right? It's the former. It's the former. Because even if you look at the uh, statistics, the data now, I believe people who identify themselves as Christians in South Korea are less than 30%. So if you think about the greater Seattle area, Puget Sound population that participated in this survey, like upper 80% tells you that data is, whoa, what's the disconnect? But what is the connection here? (laughs) And yes, it really was a place for people to gather. And the churches, after their worship, they gather and they eat Korean food as a place to also meet with other Koreans and network and also a place to do business for some. Many of them are into restaurant or small mom and pop stores or businesses. And so really that it's a church just became a place of worship, but it's a place to basically meet fellow Koreans and expand one's network and some to do business. Does that feel that trend's continuing to this day? I'm just thinking back to Korean friends of mine in college and afterwards, and it feels like the church does still play a role, just mm-hmm. anecdotally, in terms of bringing folks together. Has that been your experience in, in the work that you do? Yes, to a certain extent. And I think it's this thing about the general generational change. Many of the people who are holding on to the churches and who do congregate are what we call first-generation immigrants where English language is still not their primary language and the network and the friends are still fellow Korean Americans and that's their livelihood. I think some of that is changing with what we call second generation. Somebody like me, I'm straddling between those two generations because I went technically born here. I was raised here. And so many of what we call the second or the third generation now, they don't need that Korean language support. And they've built their communities around not fellow Korean Americans necessarily. They have no issues with language. They have no issues with food. They could basically go speak their mind. Many of them have become successful professionals in their respective careers. And so they don't need this this language or cultural crutch per se. And so many of them have left the churches. I'd say I don't have the statistics, but Some of the churches that I look around, they used to be full of young people who are my generation, but now the next generation are no longer as active in the churches. Yeah, I can see that. As you noted, it's both about worship, relationships, and food, which is a good transition to talk about food. There are many things I want to talk about food. I think when we think about Korean food, people think of kimchi and Mm -hmm. rice and meat. I want to hear from you what should healthcare professionals know about the Korean diet to speak about it in an educated manner? And what does healthy mean? I also look at it from a generational view. If we go back, go to the wave of the Korean Americans that immigrated in the 60s and the 70s, they're all recovering from war-torn Korea, right? And so back then, they did not have access to white rice. Historically, white rice was for the wealthy. White rice is, you have to afford it. They used to eat like barley. And today, I think barley is more expensive than white rice. But back then, barley was littered all over the places. And white rice was very royal, upper-class food. Because I hear horror stories uh, from my dad when he was growing up post-Korean War how hungry they were. They never had white rice when he was growing up. They were forced to eat like barley or even the white rice. What is that? The outer skin shell. And they just used that to make soup or porridge and just had disgusting food. And so when people immigrated to the U.S., right, rice was dirt cheap. It wasn't the same quality rice in Korea. Californian rice and all that stuff was dirt cheap. And so I think this white rice is something that was valued, again, by like my grandparents or my father's generation. I don't think that that kind of the valuation of white rice exists in some of the younger generation today. But if we're talking about many of the elderly in their 70s, 80s to probably about, I don't know, late 50s, 60s, I think that's the generation that really value white rice. And so everything you eat, the modern day kimchi has become less salty. But if you think about in the olden days, there was no refrigerator, 
right? They dug a hole in the ground and they buried it, which is an amazing concept, but it needed to be preserved for a long period of time. They make kimchi once a year and it's supposed to last a whole year. Mm-hmm. Well, how the hell do you make it do that? Lots of salt. And so it tended to be salty, but today it is no longer because now you can eat it without really anything to dilute it. So white rice is really diluting that saltiness, right? Just placing kimchi and eating it with the right rice. And so that's the one aspect of that, I guess, the diet. The other thing I also see is Koreans love, one of the most popular K food is this thing called tteokbokki. It's basically pieces of rice cake cooked in this red chili pepper sauce, gochujang sauce. And it is raved not only amongst the Korean young people, but amongst everybody globally. I'm going to say white Americans, black Americans, whatever. And they love this thing called tteokbokki. It's an extrusion of rice. So it's very heavy, condensed, dense rice. And so really one tteokbokki is probably like a bowl of rice. That's some serious carbohydrates there. But they used to make what they call, you know, tteok, literally called rice cakes. But it's that extrusion. At least in the U.S., we bake cakes. This is like an, a heavily dense extrusion. And another way to describe it is like the Japanese mochi. You see these men just pounding away at that sweet glucose rice. So it's that rice. And they used to put in like sweet honey or sesame seeds sweetened up and it's steamed and it's eaten. It's like a delicate test and you eat during like the New Year's. And you also consume during the Lunar New Year, or we call it the fall harvest. And especially in the New Year, this extruded rice cake, they're cut into pieces and basically made into dumpling soup. And you have to eat this thing every year because you get a year older, right? Unlike the solar calendar, the lunar calendar, you aged one year in the New Year. And so what I see is that even after meal, I see a lot of my parents and grandparents' generation that could consume probably the equivalent of four or five bowls of rice because it's extruded and they enjoy it. And it's sweet. It's delicious. And so there's a lot of desire for that. So I'd say watch out for uh, diabetes, <laughs> high glucose, sugar level in people. But also, I think when I was growing up, we ate a lot of vegetables. I don't know if people really realize that we eat lots of very lightly blanched spinach, lettuce, like lots of lettuce wraps with meat, with a lot of that spicy red pepper sauce. I think fish is also a very important part of the diet. But what I also see changing is that many of the immigrants were in war-torn Korea, meat was, you can't even afford it, right? It's so expensive. Even today, relatively, beef is more expensive than other cuts of meat. But again, relative to the prices when they're back home, it was much more affordable. And so I think the consumption is much, much higher and maybe in some instances much higher than fish. So I see that diet changing. But yes, kimchi, the Korean barbecue, the K barbecue that we all talk about, generally they marinate it with a lot of soy sauce. That just makes it taste so good. You just put soy sauce on everything and it makes it taste so good. There's this thing called gochujang. It's that red chili pepper paste based out of a fermented soybean. And which is so good for your health. Talk about probiotics, man. You don't need to take any pills. And so those are really part of the diet. And I think it's great stuff, but there's definitely a fine balance between a little bit too much salt and some of the glucose content. So when a provider is interacting with a patient, a Korean-American patient, and the question comes to diet, what might be like the emotional response even if they're like, you have diabetes or you have this other healthcare condition? And you need to cut down on some of these like key favorite foods. Is that somehow met with resistance, do you think? Or what kind of feedback do you get when you're working with the Korean American community around helping them navigate healthcare? I think many Koreans have this perception that Americans, like the Caucasians, they eat salty food, right? Their food is much saltier. French fries, loaded with salt. Hamburger, right? It's fatty. It's meat. It's got all these mayo and sauces. It's so bad for you. Kentucky Fried Chicken, pizza, cheese. The pers- they, they get it. They, these are really bad for your health. And so they think compared to that diet of most 
quote unquote Americans. We Korean, we eat rice, there's nothing bad in there. We eat kimchi, we eat veggies, we eat soup, we eat marinated beef for Korean barbecue. So we're eating really healthy. If you look at individually, what, what I think some of the Korean Americans need to realize is that many of the white population that consume so much of those burgers and, and pizza have heart problems, right? But many of the Koreans, because of the rice that we consume, and in the olden days when you were in Korea, they consumed the rice, they were like working. They were toiling away in the fields or working, whereas here we're not as active as they used to be. And so all of that carbohydrates and whatnot, when you are not burning it, it turns into fat and it's not making you as healthy as you think you are. So I think it's some of that because in general, they think, oh, those white people, man, they eat all those burgers, pizza, and they're just like so bad for their diet. But me, I'm not eating. I'm, I'm eating pretty well. So if you were in my shoes, I'm a family medicine doctor. You come to me. We just find out you have di- found out you have diabetes. What will be the best thing for me to say? Eat more of blank, eat less of blank. That makes sense to you? That holds true to, is this the retaining the authenticity of the Korean diet? I'm not going to ask mm-hmm. you to just eat more green beans and broccoli. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Curious on what that looks like to educate our providers. I think it explaining it in a way that they can grasp it real quickly. Like very few realize, again, even I don't really quite get it, like the carbs, if we don't burn it upon consumption, it all turns into all these things. I think it's not like scientific explanation, but very simple, crude way, whether I, I would use maybe even photographs, a diagram. There are many Korean television shows in Korea on health issues. And what I notice they do over and over again is for that elderly audience is graphics. They like do an animation of your stomach lining, an animation of very different cells and how particular thing reacts and boom, it's a very animated. So really, I think the healthcare professionals here, we, you guys just doctors, you guys just talk, okay? Bring visual aids and really explain it. Because for people who are maybe in their teens or early 20s or 30s, that's pretty easy, right? Most of them get it. But if you're going into people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who are recent immigrants, language may also be a challenge too. But I think if you have visual aids that really explain things to them, then I think it's much easier for them to take on that concept. And then once they know the basics of why, then you can say, hey, how about this or that? I think people also don't want to be told that you got to do this or that. But hey, you can do this, you can do that. Because as I told you, in the 70s, when people congregated at churches, it was also sharing food. Food is such an important component. So you can't take away the favorites, but you also have to have some things. If you're taking away kimchi, then it's got to be another Korean food that can replace that instead of romaine lettuce. (laughs) <laughs> That'll be my new thing. Romaine lettuce is an example. Don't do that. I love it. As we're talking about food, uh, anything else about Korean culture that everyone should be familiar with? Holidays, celebration, any specific rituals that's relevant to healthcare professionals or others? I think the two biggest holidays, it's the New Year, the Lunar New Year, which as recent as the last couple of years in, in the U.S., we celebrated. The White House even hosted a New Year celebration. So it is big. It is where they come together, share a ton of rice cakes, and families still get together, gather. I think some of the immigrant families also do what we call ancestral worship. They set out a table of food and families gather. And I notice a lot of people do practice that. And then the other big celebration is the Chuseok, or the Fall Harvest Festival. Again, that's where you bring in all the harvest and give thanks to the ancestors or to God or whoever, and it's American Thanksgiving. But what's interesting is those two are important, but what I'm also seeing is the importance of the quote-unquote American Thanksgiving. This is, again, another time for the Korean Americans and their families, because now you've got the second generation. And so first generation, second gen- intergenerations gather together and like our family's Thanksgiving dinner, you've got a turkey, but then you've got kimchi. <clears throat> a turkey and kimchi goes great together. It is an amazing <laughs> combination. 
take out that dryness out of the turkey and that kimchi, <laughs> oh, delicious. And so like my mom would prepare some of the Korean dishes, whereas I and my siblings would be preparing the corn, the potatoes. And so this is where the, the cultures come together. And then, of course, Christmas is another huge thing where, again, you've got the Korean barbecue with Christmas ham and the food that are together. So if you ask me what I like the big celebration, I'd say Korean Americans living here, they probably have about four or five big holidays that they're celebrating throughout the year. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, how we just add on holidays because it's true. We celebrate Indian holidays and American holidays. So we can just keep exactly. celebrating you know, all year long. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's so awesome. I think the other thing that the doctors need to be mindful of, especially treating or counseling some of the older generation, is that the culture they come from, remember, it's a war-torn country. Very few have this professional education to be the doctors and the lawyers. And so at least my mother's generation, these doctors are very deemed here in the U.S. Oh, you're a doctor. They're gods. There were gods in the 70s and 80s when people couldn't afford health care. And so even to this day, the doctors are like a, in a position of authority, great reverence. And so generally, whatever the doctor says, they tend to accept it without questioning. So based on what little facts that the patient gives to the doctor, will say, this is this, this. And sometimes it takes effort to pull it out of the patient. Because they just respond to the questions being asked. Now, you ask me, and I, I tell you a lot of things above and beyond what you ask me. Okay. But for that first generation, they just only answer the questions, right? And say, hey, tell me how you feel. I don't think their ability to express themselves is as great as some of the younger generation. So I think as a doctor, you really need to ask a lot of probing questions of the slightly older generation. And I had an experience with my mother. I took her to the doctors and who asked just a ton of questions, but they want you to examine. My mother wanted her doctor to examine her because just listening to what she had to say was insufficient for the doctor to make any decision on what needed to be done. And so she's like, isn't he going to examine me? I said, mom he asked a lot of questions. She's no, he needs to examine me. So that's something very important. It tells them that just whatever they say is not sufficient for you, the doctor, to know. And they want you to hear their heart, stethoscope, and touch and hear, feel their breathing just to make sure that they are being examined appropriately. So, yes, one, the doctor is in a high position of authority. And generally, whatever the doctor says, it's like accepted, even though they don't necessarily follow what the doctor says to do. They don't question. And so uh, this concept of going after second or third opinion is really not in my mother's generation. So whatever the doctor says, that's like the Bible. So those are some things to keep in mind. And then really interesting yeah. is my grandmother's generation and to a certain extent my mother's generation is that oh, the opinion and the experience of their friends are so, so important. For example, hey, my friend said her doctor prescribed this medication for her, I don't know, stuffy nose, and it just worked miracles. Oh, so she's going to give me some of hers, right? To me, I'm just like, okay, grandma, you can't do that. Not everybody's body is the same, but they have this concept where, hey, if it works for Joe, it works for me too. And so I see a lot of that happening. And then many of the Again, the grandmas are, they grew up in a culture where, remember, they didn't have doctors. And so it was what? Home remedies, right? Whatever home remedies. And for that, oh, we need this. Or I even heard my grandma say, I know about my body better than my doctor. And I think you'll see that in many patients, even to this day as well, some of the Korean Americans. And I think that's something to be also mindful of. What make a Korean patient feel comfortable, especially if they're meeting with their clinician several different times and they wanted to say, I am not able to follow your recommendations. Maybe I don't have access to the right kind of food or for whatever reason, they aren't able to do it. But given what you're describing, like the level of reverence and authority that's attached to clinicians, how could they feel like valued, seen and heard to the point where they're comfortable just openly sharing with their doctor or their clinician? 
I don't think Korean Americans are any different from any patients that you guys see, whether they're white, black, or whatever. At the end of the day, I also see many of parents of my white friends who, eh, a doctor, I don't believe him. I see that. At the end of the day, I think it's trust, right? It's how comfortable you make an individual feel. I also see some doctors who have terrible bedside manners. They're in and out. They don't have social skills. And I've seen a lot of doctors and I've criticized them for it. And so at the end of the day, I think it's empathy. I think it starts with building that relationship. I think they need to come to a place of trust and they need to feel that you really are talking in the best interest of their health care. And sometimes, even though you have no medication or solution for them, I think it's getting to know that patient because I'll give you one example of a one grandmother who I drove her as a family friend to the hospital because she had no way to get there. And then the doctor did all the thing and it's always fine. She, she's like, isn't he going to give me any medication? The somehow visit to the doctor is going to result in medicine or a shot or something. And so being attuned to that, I think it's really important. I know there are some doctors who just prescribe things that quite frankly, they don't need, but it's the mental thing. And sometimes they do it, which if it doesn't bring harm to the patient, I think it's smart. I think it's great. It's making them feel that they are getting healthier. And to answer your question in a long-winded way, I don't think there is any difference in earning the trust of the Korean American patient relative to any patient that you are seeing. It's really building their trust in you. And there, I don't think there's magic other than really taking the time. Unfortunately, today's medical, the hospital systems, it's like a construction site or it's like food processing center where the doctors need to boom, boom, five minutes, 10 minutes, you got to go on to the next patient. Well, that doesn't give you the time to really get to know your patient and to build that relationship. So our healthcare system needs to be overhauled. Amen. A lot of pro tips there. I think how I would summarize it, trying to capture all of it is one, remembering that this idea of authority that healthcare professionals hold, recognizing that because it's important to speak with confidence at the same time, making space to hear people's story. Because what I sometimes see now is this idea of shared decision making where people want to include the patient in the decision making. And I brought this up mm-hmm. before and they're like, hey, you're the doctor. Shouldn't you know? So making sure you yep. speak with confidence and holding that authority. Mm-hmm. Second yeah. is yeah. the power of an examination, because this is also a conflict between the culture of medicine and what people want. Is that from my medical perspective, if I don't need to listen to your heart to solve your problem, I'm not going to. But actually, an examination means so much more. It's an act of the human Mm -hmm. touch, act of caring, reassurance. There's so many benefits (laughs) that it is important to maybe meet people where they're at and saying, yes, I'll listen to your body and make sure you're okay, quote unquote, right? People want to know they're okay and making sure you do that. The third part that you mentioned about when people take other people's meds, I bring back to this idea of not shaming people. Because that's also a way to lose trust when you're like, what, you took your friend's medications? Don't you ever do that? I did did not tell you you could do that. So next time they're not going to tell you. So making sure you leave room for them to share, but still addressing maybe the risks of that. Hey, next time you do that, why don't you make an appointment? We'll say if that's a good medication for you or not. Or prescribing them placebo, quote unquote, not in a Mm -hmm. harmful way. The example that I use is for some of my patients who are expecting that, I could say this is over the counter or I could prescribe it for them to pick it up at the pharmacy. And it makes a huge difference Mm -hmm. whether they say just pick it up at the store down the street or here, I'm going to send it to the pharmacy for you, right? And pharmacy is deemed better. (laughs) <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. You covered a lot of points there. There's other things that came out in research. I'm curious if you feel like it's worth highlighting any in the last few minutes we have. One is this idea of shame. And I think the history is complex around that, but that chronic illness is a sign of weakness. So people don't want to go to the doctor. And there's different proverbs that I saw around this that, quote unquote, knowing can be a disease, that ignorance is medicine. A word can become a seed. I don't know what they translate to in Korean. But this Mm -hmm. idea of that, hey, it's better not to know. And it's something shameful because it seems like I did this to myself, so I don't want to know either. And then the other important themes of the collectivism and 
importance of family, I think, comes out in a lot of Asian culture, but I think it's true for the Korean culture, too. Anything worth focusing? Does that resonate with you? Oh, I think those resonate very strongly. (laughs) I think you've hit all the points there. I think you're very experienced and you've hit all those points. It's so very true. There's nothing more that I could add to that. I think those are right on the money. Okay. Any last things that you want to add for the listeners? Maha, do you have any additional questions? Yeah. One of the things that's been on my mind, and this is me growing up around a lot of Korean friends and then seeing the evolution of our culture in America to present day, where it's all about K-pop consumption of what seems to be popular culture. Do you feel like there's any unintended consequences of that that might overshadow some of the history you've shared, some of the barriers, the challenges we're against Korea's really being packaged in a particular way that seems very appealing to like mainstream audiences. Just curious about your perspective on that and how you think that might impact like even Korean patients as they're seeking care, if there's any impact on that. In my work for KWA as executive director, it's called Korean Women's Association, but we don't only serve Korean clients, probably of our over 10,000 or so clients that are served annually, probably about 35% are the elderly Koreans. I think it, the more of the K-pop, K-cosmetic, K-food, that is like the big wave with really, I just say, the younger generation, right? People who are active on uh, social media and online and they're getting all that wave. And a lot of this popularity with Korean food and everything, I think that's great. But to me, there is also a generation of el- a- aging elderly who really came to this country, who worked hard, who helped build our economy to what it is today, who told away and just gave everything they, they had, their bodies. My mom, she worked two jobs. My dad worked two jobs so that they can raise their children. And today I'm an engineer. I have an MBA. I'm a lawyer. My younger sister is a doctor. For us to be able to live out our full potential. And so that generation is not necessarily food, is not necessarily lifestyle, but also the care for them is basically needed to help the, the tough life that they have lived the strenuous physical labor that they had to put in 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And when you're young, your body may be able to take it. But as you get old, all that toil is, it takes a toll on you as you age. And so that's another very important factor to keep in mind. As all of this K-pop, K-food is glorified, we do have that wave of immigrants who came here and who just, because they couldn't speak language English as fluently as the present day generation. And so all they can do was take on menial jobs. And while Mr. And Mrs. Jones stayed home and Mr. Jones carried a briefcase, my mom and dad took a bus. They worked in factories. They worked in construction sites and their bodies physically definitely have suffered. And so I think for care providers, that's also something to keep in mind or at least ask about as you care for some of the elderly. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you again for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for having me. I hope it was helpful. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me on another episode of Healthcare for Humans. If you liked this episode, as always, my ask to you is please share it with one other person and go to healthcareforhumans.org to sign up to be part of the community. And lastly, thank you to Tessa Chu for helping with the creation and the production of all parts of this podcast. Thanks again. I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed podcasts like this, you should check out our other shows on Health Podcast Network. For example, Highway to Health Podcast, hosted by Jeremy Quinby, provides guidance, quality resources, and inspiration for anyone seeking wellness in mind, body, and spirit. There's an episode that you should check out called The Value of Our Emotions, where Jeremy helps listeners understand the role emotions serve and what we can learn about our present state by staying attuned to them. Check out Highway to Health podcast on your favorite podcast platform or visit healthpodcastnetwork.com.